Well, good morning, everyone. It is so lovely to have you with us today. <clears throat> my name is Graham, and I'm the pastor here of the church. And so it's my delight uh, to welcome you to this online service of Brunsfield Evangelical Church. Uh, we're going to do what we normally do when we gather together um, on a Sunday morning. We're going to uh, sing praises to God. Uh, we're going to uh, watch some songs together uh, with a express purpose of preparing our hearts uh, to come before him. We're going to have a talk for the children. Uh, we're going to hear from one of our members. Um, she's going to tell us about uh, a particular way that she serves uh, in the life of the church here. We're going to pray together, and then we're going to fix our attention on God's words. Um, as we finish our series in Ephesians this morning, we look forward to Archie, uh, who's going to come and preach to us a little bit later on. So why do we do this? Uh, well, we do it all with the express purpose of fixing our hearts and our minds on the one who said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so with that in mind, uh, and as we begin our time together, I'm going to hand over to Gary, uh, and Gary's going to lead us in a short call to worship. Hey guys, I hope you're all doing okay. Um, it's great to get the chance to share with you a wee bit this morning. Uh, we as a family just miss you all so much, uh, especially Marcy, I think. At this point, it's fair to say that she is well and truly fed up of just having her mum and dad for company. So she's really looking forward to getting to meet you all in person and getting to make some new friends. So we look forward to that time a lot. But just this morning, as we come to a time of worship, I just wanted to share with you a couple of things I've been thinking about this week. And I just want to read to you um, a couple of verses from Psalm 22, um, verses 3 to 5. It says this. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And another translation puts verse 3 like this. Yet you are holy and you inhabit the praises of your people. I just think that's an amazing thought to think that God inhabits the praises of his people. That means that where God's people praise him, God actually dwells there. He is enthroned there. Um, and that we can bring God glory with just this very simple act of singing to him is just amazing. Now, I know that with these online services, um, it can be so easy when the music comes on to just zone out and start thinking about other things. I know that because I'm especially guilty of it myself. Um, and especially with the worship videos that we've become so familiar with. But I just want to encourage you all this morning that even though we're all separated and isolated, God still inhabits the praises of his people. He still wants to be present with us and he desires our worship. So I just want to invite you to join with me this morning, along with all your brothers and sisters in the church, in not just letting this time pass you by, but just being really intentional as we lift the name of our Saviour high this morning. And to invite him into whatever circumstances you find yourself in and confess him Lord over all. So before we sing together, let's just pray and invite the Lord to come this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. We thank you that you desire to draw near to us this morning, whatever our circumstances. And so Lord, we come before you with genuine and sincere hearts, wanting to give you our all this morning. Lord, we worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we give you all the glory. Amen.
challenge uh, for these guys okay and the, the challenge for them is to write something okay uh, so I want you to write Jesus wait 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 uh, and I want you to write Jesus loves me okay then you okay. can do that right wait wait I haven't said go yet okay let's see can your hand right no I'm just going a bigger one okay and you can have that one. Uh, you can, that one gets that one's very bit small. Okay. Right. Okay. Off you go. Well, I should first get the. <laughs> right. First, need to turn on the pen. <laughs> right. Okay. I, well, we can't spend all day at this. So I'm only going to give you. There we go. I'm only going to give you like another 10 seconds, I think. 10, mm. 9, mm. 8, 7, <laughs> 6, oh, look, wait, look, 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 5, look. 4, 3, 2, oh. 1, 0. Okay, how did you get on? Oh dear. Nothing. I got a tiny little dot. Nothing. Okay, well that wasn't very good. I thought, I thought, you, guys, I thought you guys could write. I thought you learned to write. We yeah. can't move our fingers. Oh dear. Well, look, let me tell you what we're learning about what we're learning about 
what we're learning about today. Okay, at uh, Kids Church, we've been looking at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, we finished our series about the signs. Do you remember what the signs? How many signs were there? Seven. Seven signs. And what were they? What were those signs showing us? They were showing us who Jesus was. Uh, yeah. yeah, who Jesus was, who Jesus is. Okay, pointing to Jesus, showing us who Jesus is. Uh, and now we're thinking about what Jesus taught. Okay, and one of the, the times when he spent a lot of time teaching was uh, when he went up onto a, a hillside and he taught. And often this is called the Sermon on the Mount. And at the very start of that, um, he, he taught people and he said, um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, okay, for they will inherit the kingdom of God or theirs is the kingdom of God um, and that's maybe a bit hard for us to understand well what does that mean the blessed you know blessed are those who are poor in spirit um, and there's another translation of the bible and it puts it into maybe a simpler language particularly for kids and it says if I can remember it correctly it says God blesses those who depend only on him Okay, God blesses those who depend only on him. And there's a good illustration of that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So after Jesus has been teaching people, he goes down the hillside and then there's somebody who has a skin disease. Okay, mm. they've got some sort of skin disease and that makes them unclean. Okay, that makes them unclean. Uh, and because other people don't want to catch the skin disease. It's a bit like COVID and how we have to um, not go... Uh, to mm -hmm. different places and not spend time with people because we don't want in case we spread uh, the coronavirus yeah so this guy had a skin disease uh, and so that meant he couldn't go near people he couldn't work a job he couldn't go into the temple mm -hmm. you know and worship god the way he, he was meant to he couldn't do any of those things so he went to jesus he went to jesus and he said to ask jesus you know to heal him you know, if you're willing, you know, you know, you can heal me. And Jesus did heal him. But but the man with the skin disease, there wasn't anything he could do. There wasn't anything he could do to take away the skin disease himself. He couldn't do anything. Um, all he could do was ask Jesus. And um, there wasn't anything he could offer Jesus. He didn't have money to give to Jesus to pay for the healing he didn't have um you know he didn't have anything because he was unclean that meant and because he had the skin disease he really had nothing to offer and really he, when he came to jesus he came to jesus with just empty hands and that's what we're, we're thinking about we're thinking about coming to jesus with empty hands nothing to offer jesus okay now How do you think we could apply that to our little challenge here? Well, we couldn't. Well, I guess because we couldn't move our hands at all. You know, I didn't. I like we couldn't do anything. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't write this no. because your hands were otherwise occupied. Your hands were covered with these. But the thing was, I didn't actually say that you needed to keep those things on. Did I? Oh! Okay, I didn't say you needed to keep the safe. Okay, so it would be much better if you had empty hands, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you can just empty your hands and then, can you write? Yeah. Can you write the thing now? Yeah. Okay. Can you write it? Yeah. Easy. Is it easy peasy now? Easy, okay. And it's the thing with Jesus. We come to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus with empty hands and accept that there's nothing we can do or there's nothing that we have that's any good that we can depend on. There's nothing that we can do. Um, you know, we just need to come to Jesus totally with nothing and accept that we've got nothing, nothing to offer. Jesus, um, heal me, uh, not from a skin disease, but heal me from my sin. And that's it. We come to Jesus realising that we've got nothing. That we've got nothing. And Jesus has everything that we need. And that's what we're thinking about today. Okay? So let's pray. 
It's P. R. A. Y. A -Y. Dear God, thank you for today. We thank you for um, how <laughs> Jesus taught the people and how we can learn from Jesus' teaching even today. And I pray that you'd help us to realise that, um, you know, we have we have nothing um, that we can offer you that is that is any good, Lord. But I thank you that we don't need to, Lord, that we can just come to you with empty hands. We can come to you with nothing. And, Lord, we can receive everything from you uh, through Jesus. I pray this in his name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, and folks, let's do uh, keep remembering our young people in prayer, uh, particularly for many of them is that they go back to school this week. Wouldn't it be a great thing to uh, just keep remembering them and their families and their teachers and their schools uh, in our prayers this week? Let me just take this opportunity to tell you about two things um, that are coming up um, in the life of our church. Firstly, we have small groups uh, which are happening this week. Small groups are a wonderful opportunity um, to meet together uh, on Zoom, uh, spend some time together, pray together, but also take the things that we've been thinking about uh, on a Sunday um, as God's word is preached, taking those things and spending a bit more time applying them to our lives. And particularly this week, we're finishing our series in Ephesians. Um, I just encourage you to get along, not something you want to miss um, as we just finish that book together that's been teaching us so much as a church. Your small group leader, if you're in one, uh, will tell you when and where yours is meeting. And if you don't, uh, sorry, if you're not in a small group and you want to be part of one, then please do contact Alistair Chalmers, uh, whose details you'll find on our website. And secondly, just to mention a change to the advertised schedule, this evening we're actually having our uh, monthly Zoom prayer gathering. Uh, which we've been doing at the end of each month. Just a wonderful time to spend praying together as a church. As we look back on, I guess, the last season uh, of life and as we look forward to, to the next one and just to seek the face of our God in prayer. So we've been particularly praying for some of the things going on in our, in our world. And then we've been turning our attention to praying for some of the things that are going on in our church. And so this evening, we're going to have a particular focus on South America and the work of Latin Link, as well as praying for our nation. And then we're going to turn our attention to pray for uh, ourselves and some of the things going on in the life of this church at the minute. And it's a great chance as well to have an update uh, about the Life Explored course that's been going on over the last number of weeks. So do come along to that, just be six to seven. Uh, you'll find the Zoom details on the newsletter which went out today. Um, please do come along to that. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're now going to hear from one of our members. Um, and a particular way that she serves in the life of the church. We try and do this once a month just to spotlight a particular ministry of the church. Um, hearing about what uh, these people do um, as they serve the Lord Jesus in this way, but also hearing about why they do it. And so we're going to turn our attention this month to pastoral uh, care. Uh, and this week I had the great joy of uh, catching up with Esther, who's one of the, the members of the pastoral care team. Uh, a little, and hear, heard a little bit more about why she serves in the way that she does. So why don't we watch this together? Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to have you with us today. Uh, I'm joined by Esther. Esther, thanks so much for, for joining me this morning. Esther's a, a dearly loved member of our church, uh, along with her, her family. Uh, and she's also part of the, the pastoral care team at Brunsfield. And uh, like I said earlier, we just uh, once a month take some time to hear about different people uh, doing different things in our church, just to hear about what they're doing, but also to know how we can be best praying and supporting them as they, uh, as they serve the church in this way. So we're going to hear from Esther, who's part of the pastoral care team, a little bit more about what that is uh, and, and why she serves in that way as well. So Esther, um, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about the pastoral care team. What is it you guys do? And I'd love to hear your heart in wanting to serve the church family in this way? Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, I guess the goal of the pastoral care team really is to love, serve and care for every member and everyone um, who comes to Brunsfield Evangelical Church. And whether that's supporting them practically or spiritually, um, and really just to help the wider church help each other do that. 
um, better. Um, and God really calls us to serve, um, to bear one another's burdens, to put others' needs before our own. Um, and I think it's quite clear from Jesus' ministry on earth that we as disciples are to love one another and so therefore have a responsibility um, for our fellow brothers and sisters. And I think for me personally, there's been a few instances in my life where I feel like God has placed me right in the middle of um, quite a difficult situation um, with, with, with friends or people in my life that, and, and difficult things that they're going through. And I felt wholly unequipped and completely at my depth. Um, but I have just been there to listen, to pray and support them and love them. And I guess it's through those moments that I realised that that is what God calls us to do. Um, and I guess for me, that was like a small picture of that. Um, and how we can kind of just do that practically and in, in day in day out. So, um, yeah, I think that the main thing is is that and just to be there for each other, walking, sharing, um, crying, celebrating all these different mm. points and and the different seasons of our lives. So, brilliant, oh, so wonderful to hear. Um, and just during this last season of life, so many people have been going through so many different things. Um, I'd just love to hear about how this last season of lockdown and this whole last year of, of COVID, how have you perceived the, the needs of the church family? Uh, what are some of the ways um, that you've maybe just seen this play out over the last year um, from your vantage point of the pastoral care team? Yeah, I mean, so I guess the season has looked so different and, and much harder in many ways. Um, the fact that we're not seeing each other regularly um, and really knowing how people are and asking and asking them when we see them um, restrictions have also made that so difficult to especially now with the travel bans as well like we can't even really visit people on their doorsteps or walks um, as much and as freely as we want to um, and for without doubt like fellowship worship and community has has felt very different over the digital platform um, but I think the main crux of it it's highlighted that we really need people um, yeah. and basically we have just tried to do what we can um, to keep in touch with people and um, to let them know they're not alone and um, encourage people to keep going whether that's phone calls um, or over zoom and i guess just trying to keep connection strong amongst amongst the fellowship as, as best as we can it's great esther and i must say is uh, from my position to see that the to work with the pastoral care team as we seek just a love that the people of brunsfield uh, I'm just always so impressed about the, the prayer that goes on for people behind the scenes. And so if you're watching this today and you're wondering what these guys, so much of this is just praying for people and loving them practically. So just so grateful for that, for everything that, that goes on behind the scenes at Brunswick. So Esther, maybe you could tell us, um, having thought about all the stuff that's been going on over the last year, what are some of the ways that maybe you've seen the Lord at work? And what are some of the, maybe the encouraging stories that have come out of the last season of life? Yeah. I think what's been beyond encouraging is actually to hear the ways that so many of you have naturally been caring and supporting one another and um, possibly more than we know about um, and that's exactly what we should be doing more of and I think if anything Covid has like brought that to the fore and um, how much how much we really need that um, it's also encouraging to know that what the work of the pastoral care team do is actually only a very small part of the love and the care that's being shown amongst yeah. the fellowship which is is great um another example is amongst the older generation especially like they have been more isolated perhaps than most of us um for a longer period now and they have been so encouraged by phone calls and doorstep visits when allowed um over this past year and especially actually from the younger generation um and it's this like inter intergenerational fellowship um that's something that is really be missed um having not been together in the church so that's been so wonderful to hear stories of that and and to hear um some of the older people saying oh so and so phoned me and yeah that's just a wonderful thing um and i've just seen ways as well like people finding new ways to connect um relationships deepen and um, grow and strengthen and really people seeking to deepen their faith rather than let it dwindle in this um season of more isolation so Brilliant, Esther. Well, listen, we're, we're just so grateful for you personally and your family and all the, the people who make up the pastoral care team and work just so hard behind the scenes. I guess as a congregation watching this, uh, we'd love to just know how we can support you uh, as you just use your gifts to serve us, but also as well how we can pray for you. So how can we do those things? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um 
the main prayer point would just be that everyone in the fellowship would feel um, loved and cared for, um, especially in this time that when we can't see each other. Um, praying that God would guide us to the people who need it most. Um, and also to pray for energy and stamina for each other. Um, we know um, it can be hard. Zoom can be exhausting. Um, we have to be more intentional about it at the moment um, because we aren't just casually bumping into each other. So um, just rem remember that too. And I think lastly is just to encourage you guys to keep doing what you're doing, keep playing your part. Um, the church is, a, is, is big and there's a lot of people and a lot of people who have needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so this season, I think, more than ever before has highlighted how much we all need cared for, supported, encouraged, challenged, loved um, more than ever before. So I think we'll be, just be a stronger body for Christ if we continue to find ways of serving and loving each other better. Um, so maybe I can just encourage you to pray for um, a specific individual in the church this week or maybe start with someone in your small group um, and reach out to them and just just genuinely um, keep going and, and we'll get through it hopefully. Um, yeah, so... Brilliant, Esther. Well, well, listen, thank you so much for, for giving up your time to, to uh, chat this morning and just update us. I'm so grateful uh, for everything that you do. We're going to pray in just a few moments' time, folks, but if you want any more information um, about the pastoral care team, you can get in touch with Ruth Aird or, or Alice Perry or, or Esther. These guys would love to be able to tell you a bit more about what they do and, and maybe if you can get involved as well, we'd love to be able to chat with you on those things. Um, but Esther, thank you so much for being with us today uh, and have a great week. Thank you. Well, folks, off the back of that, we thought it'd be great to spend some time, uh, particularly in prayer just now, thinking about uh, some of the people um, who are maybe on our minds and hearts just now. And our passage this morning uh, is going to encourage us to be constantly praying for one another. And so we've just got a great opportunity to do that now as we think about particular people. Many of you will know that there are uh, lots of people who are uh, in need of prayers uh, in our church family currently who are, um, have been maybe suffering physically or uh, spiritually or mentally, whose needs are, are probably known to us. I'm so conscious that there'll be many watching this today and um, you'll be suffering with many of the same things that might not be known to us. So whoever you are here today, perhaps if you're feeling flat, <clears throat> then let me encourage us to lift our eyes to who our Heavenly Father is. So we're going to read some words from Psalm 103 together. They're going, uh, going to go on the screen. And we're just going to read, I'd encourage you, if you're at home watching this, just read these verses out um, in your living room. Might be a bit strange, but let me encourage you to go for it. And let's together remind ourselves about who our Heavenly Father is. So he made known his ways to Moses his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And so, Heavenly Father, we'd want to begin our time of prayer just by remembering who you are, that you are a God full of mercy and of grace, abounding in steadfast love, and a God who has made a way for our sins to be forgiven, past, present, and future. Forgiveness to be found at the cross of Jesus Christ, and so, Father, we just praise you for that truth today. And Lord, we praise you for your fatherly care for us, your people. Thank you, Lord, that you know us. You know how we are formed. You know the things going on in our lives. You know the ways that we hurt. You know the questions that we have. Father, thank you that you know us and that you love us. 
And so, Father, we want to bring to you some of the people in our own congregation, Lord, for whom this week and this last season of life has been really difficult. Father, we want to bring to you in prayer Alistair and Sabina Chalmers. Father, and just thank you that Alistair is making a, re a recovery, Lord, as, as uh, he's come out of hospital. Father, we love these people. And we, Father, we pray that you would just be near to them just now. We think of Lynn, Lynn Graham as well, Lord, who was in hospital this week as well. And Father, we thank you that she seems to be making a recovery. And we pray particularly for her, Lord. That you would just be with her, Lord. Surround her with your steadfast love. We think of Dorothy Layton, Lord, with the passing of Robert, and we think particularly of the funeral service on Tuesday of this week. And Lord, we pray right now that she would just be aware of your presence with her. We think of Ian and of David and all of the, the friends and family, Lord, who will be uh, either there or who perhaps even can't be there because of restrictions at the minute. We pray for that whole situation, Lord, that you would be at work there. Father, we lift to you the Ponton family. Lord, we pray for Michael and for Douglas and for Ruth. And Lord, we particularly pray for Fiona in hospital still. Lord, in light of um, everything that's going on there, Father, we pray that you would just particularly be with uh, her, Lord, in our hospital room just now. Lord, thank you um, for your people who are gathering around her to encourage her. Lord, we just pray a blessing for the family, Lord, that they would just be aware of, Lord, your compassion on them and your fatherly care for them right now. Oh, Lord, we're so aware, Lord, of, of many who will be watching this, who will be struggling in, in silence. Lord, who will be struggling with loneliness and stress and anxiety and just struggling with missing friends and family. And, and so, Lord, we just want to pray that you would be at work in all of these situations. Father, thank you for what we've just seen, what Esther has just shared about the pastoral care team and, and the many who work behind the scenes to pray for people and also just to support them practically. And so, Lord, we do just pray that you would continue to strengthen them as they serve you. Lord, would you put it in other people's hearts perhaps to... Uh, join and, and, and uh, participate in what's going on. Father, we thank you so much for the, the love that has been so evident amongst the members of the congregation in this time. And we thank you, Lord, that that is just an extension of the love that you have first loved us with. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us just to reflect on the truths of Psalm 103. Father, that we would know you as a good father in our lives at present. And so, Lord, we pray as we turn to your word now and as Archie brings us the, the challenge from Ephesians 6, Lord, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and equip us, Father, for the Christian life as we lead it uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ as we continue to follow him. So, Father, thank you so much that you hear our prayers and we make them to you, Lord, knowing that you hear us because we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, folks, we're going to turn to God's Word now, so let me encourage you to grab a Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, and we're going to jump in at verse 10, and we're going to read all the way through to the end of the letter. The verses are going to go on the screen, and we'll read these together, but let me encourage you to get um, the Bible uh, in front of you. It's so uh, important that we have God's Word in front of us as we turn there. And as we finish this series in Ephesians this morning, let's be encouraged and equipped as we think about all that God is calling us to do here. So this is Ephesians chapter 6, in at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And God will bless the reading of his words this morning. And just before Archie comes to speak to us, uh, we're going to watch this song as we prepare our hearts, this song uh, called Flee to Christ. Oh, praise 
praise his name. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, let me add my welcome. My name is Archie. I'm one of the ministry trainees here at Bruntsfield. Uh, and like Graham said, let me encourage you to, to have your Bibles open in Ephesians. If you're not already there, um, let me pray uh, as you do turn there. Heavenly Father, with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this morning. Amen. Uh, imagine with me, it's February 1945, World War II. You're crouched down low. The floor underneath you is a cold, hard, forgiving met- unforgiving metal. Your hands are freezing numb as they grip your rifle. Your socks are soaking wet in your boots. You can't help but think the war is supposed to be over. D-Day was months ago, but here you are. Your stomach is still turning, that familiar horrible mixture of anxiety and the motion sickness from the boat that rocks steadily in the waves underneath you. The air around you is pregnant with uh, an expectant silence and you look around the boat and you see the faces of your friends, that is your friends that are still alive. And then the boat hits the sand, the landing ramp is lowered, and you know that you have got to keep fighting. In a similar sort of way, in the Christian life, Jesus has already won the victory against sin and against death. But make no mistake, we too are nonetheless still at war. See, it was more than 300 days after D-Day before the war actually ceased. And for us, a little bit like in World War II, victory has really already been won. And yet the battle rages. And you know, we have a God who one day is going to come back and wrap the whole thing up. But in the meantime, we fight. And we fight on the winning side. In today's passage, Paul does not pull any punches. He says to the Ephesian church, you have a relentless enemy, a spiritual enemy. We see that in verses 10 to 12, a spiritual enemy. But they also have a God who has provided everything that they need to stand firm in this battle. He's given them spiritual armor to protect them. In verses 13 to 17, spiritual armor. And he's given them spiritual weapons with which to fight back. In verses 18 to 20, spiritual weapons. So that's where we're going this morning. But where have we been in this letter? Why not come back to chapter 1 with me? Chapter 1, verse 20. What is Christ doing there? He is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms. Now that is totally mind-blowing in and of itself. This is Jesus who came to earth as a man, died in our place and rose again. And he's now seated at the right hand of God and he rules there from his throne. But it gets even more mind-blowing. Come to chapter 2 with me. Verse 6 of chapter 2 says this, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Get this, this is what it means to be in Christ. This is the identity of the Christian sitting with the ruling Christ in heaven, sitting. But then in chapter four, 
we get a change of posture. Eight times the Ephesians are told to walk in the middle section of this letter. Sometimes our translation masks this a bit, but if you come to verse 1 of chapter 4 with me, you will see what I mean. Verse 1 of chapter 4 in the NIV, it says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Uh, And maybe a closer translation might be, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Paul says, you have been raised up to sit with Christ. That is your identity. Now live like it. Walk the walk. I don't know about you, but as we've gone through these walk passages in the last few weeks as a church, I have been really challenging, uh, challenged. Um, because walking this walk is just so obviously not easy. And in today's passage... Paul acknowledges that. He gets really honest. He gets very real with the Ephesian church. He says it's hard to walk the walk because there is a spiritual enemy trying to bring them to their knees. Did you notice in our passage today, Paul's encouragement to the Ephesian church to stand? Back in chapter 6, have a look at verse 11 of our passage. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand And then in verse 13, halfway through verse 13, that you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand, stand firm then. Paul is clear, they are going to need help just to stay on their feet. And though the victory has already been won, if they're going to keep walking as those who sit with Christ, they are going to have to fight to stay standing. So we've got to ask that question, and this is really our first point. Who is this spiritual enemy that is trying to bring the Ephesian church to their knees? In the last uh, hundred years or so, the predominant worldview in this country, in the West, has been one that denies spirituality altogether. It's the view that if we can't interact materially with something, then it simply doesn't exist. If we can't measure it, then it must be made up. If I'm really honest, that is the non-Christian worldview that I find most tempting. I guess I really want to think that, that we're in control. And you too maybe might be tempted to think that this spiritual warfare stuff is a load of nonsense. That it doesn't exist. But the first step to taking a stand against any enemy is acknowledging that that enemy is really there and then really understanding what that enemy is doing. Maybe you take the opposite view. Uh, There are those who think that this material worldview is fading in favour of a sort of 21st century mystical spiritualism. You know, people who seek to explain everything we can't understand by describing it as spiritual or even demonic. And actually, that's probably uh, quite a lot closer to the Ephesian experience. See, in the ancient world, a a spiritual understanding of the world around them was, was a pretty normal way to think. But that spiritualization of the things that we can't explain is not what our passage is talking about either. So what does our passage say? Did you notice at the end of verse 11? Have a look at at the end of verse 11 with me again. Whose schemes are we talking about here? It is the devil's schemes. See, the devil is a very real spiritual being who exists in total rebellion against God. He's not equal to God and he has been defeated. But he nonetheless seeks to turn hearts away from their creator. He's not a pointless evil. He has a goal in all of this to influence hearts away from God. Have a look at verse 12 with me. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
This verse is not talking about an inherent evil in authority. It's not talking about overreaching government or police states or even lockdowns. Instead, this verse is a glimpse into the spiritual tools that the devil has at his disposal in his heart-turning mission. That's his goal, to turn hearts away from God. And so for us, I think it's important that we look in the mirror before we look out of the window. Because he exercises that influence in my heart, and he exercises that influence in your heart too. And how does he do that? I think the Bible gives us two primary ways that the devil influences hearts. Firstly, he tempts us to sin. He asks us, did God really say? Just like he did with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, he causes us to doubt God's word and the consequences of sin. And then he says that sin will be good for us, that we will enjoy it, that we deserve it. He tempts us to sin. And secondly, he then accuses us in our sin. He tells us that despite what Jesus has done, because of our sin, we are utterly condemned. He tempts us and he accuses us. But our passage says we have got to stand against those lies. And our passage tells us that God has provided protection for us as we do that. Spiritual armour. Before we get into the armour, have a look back at verse 10 with me, because there's something really key here. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. If our enemy is a spiritual one, superhuman if you like, then on our own we are utterly powerless against his schemes. Powerless on our own, but protected by God. This armour is God's power It is his provision. It is his protection. So come with me as we explore uh, the first piece of armour in verse 14. Verse 14, the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, the spiritual purpose of each piece of armour is given to us in their description. Did you notice that? It says here, it's the belt of truth. Truth is the important thing, not that it is a belt. So what is truth? What is truth? Well, truth is an absolutely accurate description of reality. It is what really is. Truth is all about fact rather than opinion. And in chapter 1, Paul told the Ephesians that they were included in Christ when they heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation. So Paul is saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ultimate truth of the universe, of reality. That is the the truth that sin is rebellion against God, the truth that its consequences are, are, are eternal death, and the truth that God's plan to bring his people into a relationship with him is in Christ. And if the Ephesians are going to have any hope of standing firm against the devil's schemes, they are going to have to stand firm in this truth. I think truth as a concept is becoming increasingly tricky. Maybe you've noticed that too. Phrases like, my truth, or that might be true for you, are just so normal these days. And to be honest, when people say things like that, I think they're really talking about opinion. Not truth, not really, because that's not how truth works, is it? If two things contradict each other, even if it's in quite a small way, they can't both be true. If I say that Wales beat Scotland in the rugby last weekend, and you say that Scotland beat Wales, those statements can't both be true. Nor could we both be true if we came up with different scorelines for the game. And so for us in church life, we have got to be aware that this is how truth works. As we study God's word together, we can't allow this my truth tendency to creep into what we're doing. 
Instead, we've got to work hard to discover together what the biblical author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was contributing to this gospel of truth. What is the author, what is the Holy Spirit saying about human rebellion? What are they saying about God's rescue mission in Christ? We've got to discover that truth. This is our first protection against the devil's lies, the belt of truth. Next, we have the breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness is a, a legal term. It means to be utterly innocent. And I think there are two sorts of righteousness in view here. First and foremost, the Ephesians can stand utterly blameless before the God of this universe, not because this breastplate enables them to live a perfectly righteous life, but instead because Jesus the truly righteous one, the one who really did live a righteous life, has died in their their place. And so it's his righteousness that they wear. It's a given righteousness. But not only are they given this identity of righteousness, but Christ also does give them the ability to live increasingly righteous lives in him. The ability to start walking the walk. Not walking into a righteous identity, but walking out of an identity already won by Christ. I mentioned at the start that one of the ways that the devil targets us is by accusation. And he does that because the reality is, even with the breastplate of righteousness, we all fail to walk the walk consistently, don't we? And what the devil does is that he accuses us, he persuades us that we aren't really saved, that our sin is too bad or too secret or too ongoing to possibly be covered by the cross. Sometimes he causes us to accuse ourselves like that, turning our own thoughts against us. Sometimes he uses others to accuse us. Well-meaning friends focusing in on one sin or another and condemning us for it. Sometimes he uses our circumstances to accuse us. Persuading us that whatever is going on in life, the cards that fate has dealt us, wouldn't possibly be so bad if it wasn't for our sin. And Sometimes the opposite is true, and isn't this tricky? He persuades us that we are righteous enough on our own. The devil loves to accuse us. And so by faith, we've got to put on this breastplate, which is the righteousness of Christ, his righteousness, because that is what it takes to make us acceptable to God. The breastplate of righteousness. Next, have a look at verse 15 with me. Verse 15, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Paul says, the right footwear is really important. Take yourself back to World War II and imagine that instead of those sturdy, if slightly damp combat boots, you're wearing a pair of high heels. Or as my wife Katie put it the other day as we looked at this passage together, you wouldn't want to climb Everest in flip-flops. They're silly examples, but Paul is saying that in the spiritual battles of Christian life, our spiritual shoes are essential as we stand. Did you notice in verse 15, why? Did you notice what this spiritual footwear is for? It says there, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Peace between us and God. And as a result, peace between us on earth. We heard last week from Graham about the various relationships in the Ephesian church, the variety of age and gender and socioeconomic status. Paul says that the gospel that has brought you peace with God also brings you peace with one another. And not only that, but you must be willing and ready to share that gospel peace with those who don't yet know it. For us here at at Brunsfield, we we also live in a multicultural city, don't we? 
And in many ways, our church here beautifully illustrates that. But it is a sad truth that we still tend to gravitate towards people who are just like us. And it's because the devil does not want us to be gospel people who live in peace with God and therefore with each other. And he does not want the gospel of peace to be proclaimed. But we can be willing to extend this gospel of peace to unlikely people, to those who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who don't think like us. You know, it really is my experience that putting on this footwear and stepping over the pain line to share the gospel with unlikely people can just be so encouraging because I think God uses our willingness to step out for him like that to defend us against the accusation that the gospel of peace is powerless. Feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Next, have a look at verse 16 with me. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith. Not a willful attempt to convince themselves of things for which they have no evidence, but the gift from God that unites them to Christ, by which, as we've seen, they are seated in the heavenlies with him, by which, as they grow, they walk into who they have been made to be. This is what the Ephesian church needs, faith. But what are these fiery arrows that the shield of faith is protecting against. I think certainly the devil's schemes in general, but I think maybe more specifically the fears and doubts that attack faith, the things that undermine the Ephesians' identity in Christ. I think what Paul is saying is that those niggling fears and doubts are a little bit like the sting of pain caused by an arrow. But remember that these are fiery arrows. And it does not take long before fears and doubts burst into flame. What feel like small fears and doubts in this life, if they are not dealt with, with the gift of faith, can so quickly become a much bigger problem. You know the feeling, I'm sure. When a friend asks a question about God and it completely stumps you, Or you see the horrific behaviour of a group of people who call themselves Christians and it's just so discouraging. Or as the devil accuses you in your sin and you begin to doubt the life-changing power of the gospel in your life. Friends, in those doubts and in those fears, we have the wonderful gift of faith. Faith that God in Christ is our personal saviour. Faith in his promises, that he never fails. Faith in his providence, that he is always in control. That is the defensive power of the shield of faith. And Paul says, take up this gift. The final gift then is the helmet of salvation in verse 17. Paul takes this image of the helmet directly out of Isaiah chapter 59, where the Lord wears the helmet of salvation as he wins the victory for his people. See, salvation is what the Lord has done for us. The devil deceives us, causes us to doubt, to be discouraged and to fear. And through all of that, the devil is attacking our assurance of salvation. The church in Ephesus desperately trying to walk against the tide of the culture around them. And the devil would be accusing them in their sin and telling them that what Jesus had done for them on the cross was not enough. But it's a lie. Friends, there is nothing that we can do or have done that can separate us from the love of Christ. He has done everything necessary to restore us to God and to seat us with him in heaven This helmet is simply a wonderful reminder of that salvation that he has won for us. And actually all of this armour, 
The whole thing, it's, it's a gift from God. It's about what he has done. In verse 11, it's his mighty power in which we are to be strong and to stand. Before we move on, just note that to stand in this battle, no one piece of armour will do. Did you notice that in our passage in verse 11 and in verse 13? Paul says, put on the full armour. If we're going to have any chance of standing at all, we're going to need all of it. But God does not stop with the armour. He gives us spiritual weapons with which to fight back against the devil's schemes. Two spiritual weapons I think we're given from this passage. The first, have a look at the second half of verse 17 with me. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We cannot separate the spirit and the word that the spirit has inspired and continues to act through. And so as we read the Bible, God's word, as we share it with others, even now as it is preached, his spirit is at work. And he is a most effective weapon against the devil's schemes. One of the first things, as we've already seen, that the devil does in the story of the Bible is cause mankind to doubt God's word. Did God really say that's the line that the devil used to sway Adam and Eve. And the same is true today. We don't use swords in warfare today, do we? Because they're just nowhere near as effective as guns and bombs and whatever else the army use. And I think we've sort of done the same thing with God's word. We've believed the lie that it's no longer effective, that it's not relevant anymore. That we need something other than the Bible to help us really know the Lord and fight the devil. But through his word, the spirit is at work in us and in those that we share it with. And it is a most potent weapon against the schemes of the devil. The second weapon, and it's linked to the spirit. Do you see in verse 18? Have a look at verse 18 with me. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, prayer isn't mentioned specifically as a weapon, but it seems to flow on here with the reference to the spirit. And I think there's just such an emphasis on prayer here. I think Paul wants the Ephesians to take up prayer as a spiritual weapon. Did you notice that emphasis? He says, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers for all the Lord's people. Paul says, just get praying all the time. Pray in all ways. Pray for all people. Pray. And three things I think that Paul says to get praying for. Pray for yourselves. You see that? All kinds of prayers and requests. Friends, don't hesitate to ask God to act in your life, to aid you in this battle. Pray too for other Christians, for all the Lord's people, Paul says. Pray for your friends at church and even pray for those folks in the church down the road. They're in this battle too. And finally, in verse 19, Paul asks them to pray for him. Have a look at verse 19 with me. Pray for me also that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And then at the end of verse 20, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He's asking them to pray for him and specifically to pray for him as he shares the good news with folks who don't know Jesus. And so we too can pray for those who don't know Jesus and for each other as we seek to share him with them. So pray for yourself, pray for other Christians and pray for a world that doesn't know Jesus. These are our spiritual weapons in this battle. This is how we will win back ground through the word of God and by prayer, both empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, a quick reminder before we finish from Paul uh, that we don't do this alone. Have a look at verse 21 and 22 with me. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. I just think that's such a wonderful picture of how early Christianity functioned. As these guys travelled from place to place, sharing these letters and encouraging each other. Maybe when we're allowed to travel again, next time you go on holiday, even if you just head up to the highlands or down to the Lake District, why not find a local church there? Allow yourself to be encouraged by the people there taking up this armour and standing against the devil's schemes. And why not encourage them too? Share what's going on here at Brunsfield. Pray for one another. We do not do this alone. Now, as we finish, let me take you back to the war. Your hands are still painfully numb on your rifle. Your toes are swimming in your socks. And then that pregnant silence gives birth to officers' whistles and the whistles of artillery and then shouting and explosions and it's chaos. You stand up and there are hundreds of little boats just like yours, thousands of men running onto the beaches to fight. The enemy might have been defeated on D-Day, but they continued to fight brutal battles like this one for more than 300 days before the war was over. Friends, Christ has won the victory. The outcome is sure. But be under no illusions. The enemy is still active. And he wants to bring us to our knees. So take up what we've been given to survive the battle. Take up the gift of spiritual armour. Take up your spiritual weapons and fight. Knowing that the victory is is sure. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have done uh, everything to win the victory in this battle, that we know that in Christ we fight on the winning side. But would you help us to take up this armour, to wear it daily, would you help us to, through your word and by your spirit and as we pray, win back ground against the devil's schemes in our lives and the lives of those around us. Amen. We're going to sing our final song now. Uh, it's a brilliant opportunity to respond to the God who gives us all that we need in this battle. We rest on thee.
thank you so much Archie and folks let me encourage us again in light of that challenge to get along to the prayer meeting tonight um, it's six o'clock as we together take our stand in the spiritual battle but thank you so much for watching today we're just going to close with the words that Paul pens at the end of this letter to the Ephesians he says peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, thank you so much for being with us today and have a great week.